want the original Mission to Saturn. Forget Sonic, we want Ultra Sonic. Move aside Explorer and Smith's Sherpas are much more fun. Before you had the like of Richard Meal at Formula One, Sterling Moss was wearing an Enercar chronograph. In the mix with Rolex Submariner and Blank Pan 50 Fathoms in testing by the US Navy. Big and colourful 20 years before the G-Shock. Subdial craziness. I will be your Sherpa guide as we illuminate an awesome area of vintage watchdom, the incredible Enercar brand. As is my style, I'll be a little Jim Clark in the speed of going through this. I've been fortunate enough to benefit from some amazing research from others in making this video, so if you want to dive deeper, please do consult the description and references for further details. Arist Racine's parents moved from their hometown of Grenchen to Longnau and opened up a workshop producing cylinder escapement watches next to a toll house there in 1897. These cylinder escapement watches were a favourite of the Swiss, an original innovation from Thomas Tompion, furthered by George Graham, but at this point were more towards the cheaper perceived side of the spectrum. After outgrowing this premises, they moved to a factory in Kirkmat in 1902, running into trouble in later years where the brand was a little bit dormant. The young Arist Racine left for Le Chaux de Fonds after 1910 to work at various watchmaking businesses, during which he met Emma Blatt, and they got engaged in 1911, marrying in 1912, and starting their own business together in 1913, that was the foundation of modern day Enicar. Here is an example of one of the trench watches produced by Aris Tracine from 1915 for the Great War that had a compass embedded into the watch. They would ultimately move back to Longnau using the land around the original premises and started to make their own movements in a larger factory, with Ariste bringing in his brother Oscar to lead this after 1918. If you're wondering about the name, Enicar is Racine spelt backwards, which is a brand that they would start to use over time from this period. Aris's son of the same name would join the board of the company in 1934 and take things over in 1940. During World War II, remember the Swiss retained a neutral position during the war, Enicar was apparently in the running to be one of the dirty dozen, but a rumoured to have sold watches to the other side, which likely kept them out of the running for that contract. But they did apparently provide watches to the British, and may have done to the Germans, apparently the sport model from 1940 was a favourite amongst the American military visiting Europe during the war. In the late 40s, they would adopt their iconic Saturn logo, one of the first things that catches the eye of a collector now. I love the whole sci-fi vibe of it. They were so attached to that logo that they would install a massive moving one on the roof of their main building in the late 50s at significant expense. Early 50s watches from Enicar include this Valjoux-based chronograph, varieties of Inca-block-based watches, which was a shock protection system, they had dress watches, moon phases, and pointer dates. The Sportster and Marine Matic were models you'd see around this time. In the early 50s, they began developing a good proportion of their movements in-house. Their calibre AR1010, the AR standing for Ariste Racine, would secure chronometer certification by Neuchâtel in 1954. Apparently the watches marked Super Test were the brand's highest grade chronometers, in line with cost certification and are worth a chunk of change. It was around this time Enicar adopted their ultrasonic cleaning and oiling method that apparently lengthened the lifespan of the watch and would be heavily marketed, including on the dial face. These watches would often have very distinct turtle style lugs, named as such for obvious reasons, but there were straight legged versions too. They even did alarm versions, and there was a memo start using a Lamagna movement. Enicar would start to adopt a case that deployed a compressor case made by Irvin Picares SA, EPSA, famous case makers that worked for many brands. For example, it was then that designed the iconic Hoyer Monaco case. Enicar would brand the compressor case as Sea Pearl, similar to the branding of things like the Oyster of Rolex. I love the diver emblem on their case backs that they started using from 1957. The first watch in 1955 used a Brevet 98243 bayonet type compressor case, the EPSA Stop. The Brevet 314962 was a bayonet super compressor case used for the 600 branded watches. What would become the defining marketing link for Enicar arguably started in 1956, when Dr. Albert Egler's Swiss teams, supported by 22 Sherpas, climbed Mount Everest and Lotzer and wore Enicar ultrasonic Sea Pearl 600 watches, known as the Sherpas, later Sherpa line, following this link. An interesting note is that Ernst Schmied wore a different Enicar watch, the Thermograph. Sherpa ultrasonics were worn on the 1957 Mount Kenya expedition, 1961 Mount McKinley scientific expedition, and photography trips to to the Sahara. Another marketing stunt was attaching a Sherpa ultrasonic chronometer to the Mayflower 2 in 1957 on a celebratory redo of the original pilgrimage trip to demonstrate the resistance of their cases. 
In 1960, Enicar displayed their watches designed for the new jet age, with increasing levels of transatlantic flights occurring. Remembering this was the era of the Rolex GMT Master, Enicar offered the Sherpa Guide, with two crowns, with one rotating the GMT bezel, and there was a city bezel around the outside. This was a massive for the time, 44mm, so had some serious wrist presence. The one in yellow and black was meant to be for me, as it's my channel colours, just like my Seiko A829. These would be available in all sorts of crazy colours, and are a real favourite of the Enercar collector. The Jet at 36mm and Super Jet at 40mm would be similar to the guide, except without the outer rotating city bezel, making them slightly smaller. Other models were the Sherpa Steward, not sure I'd want this one if I could be a pilot, the Sherpa GMT, and Sherpa World Time. A more out there option for dual time was the Enercar Admiral with two different dials. I kind of love this obscurity, and an equally crazy model was this seven dialed Universal Time Watch from 1967. The collectors have dubbed the Kaleidoscope. Enercar still continue the expedition links of the 1969 trip to Tukesh Peak with Sherpa Jet, Sherpa Dive and Sherpa Graph chronographs. Staying on the Sherpa Graph, powered by the classic Valjou 72, the Enercar marketing team would forge links with Sterling Moss, the famous British F1 driver, which was heavily leveraged in their advertising. Jim Clark was another F1 driver that linked in with Enercar, and there's somewhat more evidence of him actually wearing one outside of fulfilling his marketing obligations. One of the other famous drivers that was a collaborator was Gerhard Mitter, and other racers with Enercar links include Innes Island, Phil Hill, and Jeff Duke, the sidecar racer. The Sherpa Graph's models would go from Mark 1, produced from 1960 to Mark IV produced from 1968. The Super Graph would have a bezel and would be used by the Swiss national shooting team in the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. Other names used for the Chronograph range were the Jet Graph produced in four versions, Aquagraph produced in four versions as well, and the Graphomatic. Another interesting one has no real brand name, hence being referred to as Garnix, which is German for nothing. Check out these later 70s chronos with some fun case and subdial stylings. And there would be a Big Eye version with one of the subdial being slightly larger. It wouldn't just be cars, Enercar made inroads into cycling with a team, the 1967 Enercar Tigra team, and Australian tennis player Ken Rosewall would wear a Sherpa date in 1958, a relatively conservative looking number. Under the sea. Under the sea. Before the Sherpa dive, we had the Sea Pearl 600 in the late 1950s that was tested by the US Navy's Experimental Diving Unit, alongside the Blang Pan 57s and Rolex Submariner 6538, where it fared relatively well despite ultimately being rejected due to a lack of a countdown bezel. There is also the Ocean Pearl watch, one of the less commonly referred to models from the early 1960s. Enercar would get into proper tooltastic dive watches with the Sherpa dive watch with the 600 foot water resistance rating. The dive watch would be displayed at Basel 1958 in a tank full of Roman eels. The Sherpa Super Dive was worn during the discovery of the Mary Rose shipwreck found in 1971 and was worn by Dr. Hans Haas, maker of underwater documentaries. These watches were apparently worn by both the Italian and Polish Marines, and Enercar would produce the Ultra Dive range, the Divette and Super Divette watch, the Mini Dive, and the Star Diver. A cool reference here is that actor Alain Delon wore an Enercar Ultra Diver in the movie Adieu Lamy opposite Charles Bronson, and Ed Sheeran is also a fan of the Ultra Dive. Some of these would feature the Ruby Rotor Caliber that was 30 joules, and this would be marked on the dial. Another cool diver they made that you see less referenced is the Sherpa OPS Super Compressor Watch. Outside of these tool watches, the Enercar Sherpa Star was a more fashionable sporty watch. Introduced in 1965, there was a whole bunch of different case shapes and dial designs within this range that I'll give you a little fashion show of now. The Revelation brand was more of a pure dress watch. This is a nice point to mention some of the collaborations Enercar did with a variety of folks, which is why you find many Enercar models with another name on the dial. For example, Al Prosa, Burks, Rideau, Healthways, Woods, Bel Air, Aqualung, and Chronosport amongst many others. She's electric. Enercar joined the electric watch market in 1961, with the Sherpa Electric using a Lander and Caliber, and Enercar would join the world of quartz with the Super Quartz series. Following the Seiko Astron in 1969 and the entrance of digital watches in 1972, the quartz crisis would get into full swing, and Enercar were very much victims of this. Here are some of their quartz numbers with funky spacey designs. They would have some very fun digital models during this period too, including a rebadged calculator watch, and some Anadigi models, and even some mechanical 
mechanical digitals, but their hearts weren't really in it. Enikar would limp along, not being part of the large Swiss groups that would become the Swatch Group, and essentially broke down and got sold off to Hong Kong based entities during the 80s. You can still buy Enikar watches today from the current owner of the brand, but collectors tend to consider the original Enikar brand ending in around 1987, hence the focus for this video. Another brand has popped up from fans of the original Enikar brand, the Sherpa brand, which has also licensed the ESPA Diver Helmet logo, and see here their reimaginings of the OPS and Ultra Dive models. A word of caution, the vintage Enikar market is full of watches of questionable authenticity, which has a variety of reasons behind it, so do be careful out there if they are of interest. And that's it for today's video, I hope I've given you a flavour of the great Enikar brand, and if you enjoyed this one, my guess is that you may enjoy my recent video on the French based brand, Lip. So do click on the link and take a look.